What I'm going to do in this video is to show you the key considerations you have to make when you are considering setting up a representative volume element modeling of any kind of engineering material of interest. If that's what you're interested in, let's sit back and relax as we get started with this video. All right, so as we get started, I want to read from a section in my book, which is this book, Finite Element Applications, A Practical Guide to the FEM Process. And within the book, in chapter five, I want to read my definition that I've provided here about what representative volume element is. And it says that a representative volume element is a subset of a virtual domain that captures the entirety of the physical problem such that the FEM solution can still be obtained without loss of generality or accuracy. And I want to start from that because we need to know what an RVE is before we look at what RVE modeling is. So the first consideration here in defining whether to use a representative volume element approach is, can you isolate a representative volume element of the problem that you want to solve? And in isolating that, you want that to be a subset of the virtual domain. It shouldn't be the whole domain, just a subset of the domain. So for example, if you're trying to model a tensile specimen, are you able to get the same sort of result that you're looking at without modeling the full element, but rather you model half of the element or one quarter of the element? If you're trying to study a synthetic form, would you model the whole form architecture or would you get away with just a concentration of a subset of the form architecture. So these are the first considerations you need to make. Can you identify an RVE of your domain of which you can then base your solution on that before you go ahead? So whether you're working with the RVE or you're working with the whole model, for you to undertake a representative element modeling of your problem, you need to be able to isolate an RVE of that. If you have not subscribed to this channel, I encourage you to please do subscribe to this channel because it makes sense for me to continue to build this community of people that are enthusiastic about computational modeling. So I do want you to continue subscribing and being here so that we'll continue to form this community where everyone is excited about what's happening in computational modeling. And let's continue with the video domain. Okay, so the second thing that you need to consider when you're trying to decide whether to work with an RV modeling approach or a different approach is to look at the constituents of the domain that you're working with. Are you able to explicitly model the constituents that make up the domain? So let's look at an example. If you're trying to model a unidirectional composite, the constituents would typically be made up of the matrix, be made up of the fiber, and at times the interface. Do you have a constitutive model that explicitly models those constituents in their entirety of behavior? If you can do that, then it, mean, it means to a large extent, you are able to approach your solution using the ROVE modeling. One of the challenges that people have is that they are often not able to do that. At times you may have some constitutive behavior for some, for some others you may not, in which case it doesn't make sense to use an RV approach. The third thing that you need to consider is the boundaries of the constituents. So for example, we're looking again at the unidirectional composites. You have boundaries between the fiber, the interface and the metrics. So what is going to happen at those interfaces? Do you have a way of describing those interfacial behavior for that domain? Where you are not able to define that, then it becomes a challenge whether you can actually realistically use an RV modeling approach in your consideration. Why this is important is that the behavior of the constituents are typically quite different. So if you consider a matrix, for example, a polymer matrix with a e-glass fiber and with an affected region, which is the interface region, they will all have different constitutive behavior. So how do you handle the fact that you're transiting from a matrix to an interface to a fiber? What is the constitutive behavior of those interfaces between them? Are you able to describe them? Are you able to define them explicitly in order for you to go ahead and use this approach that we're talking about, which is the RVE model? Typically, what people do with composite systems or even you know synthetic form structures is to model them by some sort of a cohesive zone modeling or an XFEM approach in considering what's happening at those interfaces. If you have a way of describing the fracture behavior at those interfaces, then by all means, go ahead and use that approach in considering how to model an RV modeling of your problem. The fourth thing that you need to consider 
is the boundary condition of the domain. Boundary conditions are absolutely critical when you're trying to use an, a finite element method in solving your problem because the conditions of the boundary will determine to a large extent how convergent your solutions are. So but the challenge with a representable element model problem is that you're looking at a subdomain and that subdomain most of the time is within the microstructure of the system you're studying. So the boundaries are quite removed from what's the domain that you're considering. So how are you able to translate what's happening at the boundary far removed from the subdomain you're using onto the domain or your RV of consideration? And so that leads us to this consideration of can you realistically represent the boundary conditions in a viable and realistic manner within your RV? For where the loading cases are very simple, let's say it's a uniaxial tensile deformation loading. That is quite easy. Because all you're doing is that you're finding that everywhere within the microstructure, the dominant loading system is uniaxial, is tensile. And so even when they isolate a small domain within the structure, you could nicely apply the boundary conditions on that domain and there won't be any problem. But when you begin to have complex loading history, where fracture begins to form, where nonlinearity begins to build up in the system, then the far removed boundary conditions of your system become a bit challenging when you reduce it to the microstructure of consideration, which is the RV. And in that instance, it becomes really challenging to deal with the boundary condition. One of the ways for trying to solve this problem where you've got this disconnect between the far removed boundaries and the localized domain of interest is to use what is called the periodic boundary condition. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about periodic boundary condition, I will suggest you look at this video or this video that I've made that shows you not only the theory of boundary condition, but actually how you can apply boundary conditions on a domain. It's really important in RV modeling that you use some sort of periodic boundary condition where the boundary, the loading histories are not always typically easy to isolate and where there's a lot of heterogeneity within the domain, then a boundary condition is a way to go about it. Another thing that you need to consider, which in this instance is a fifth consideration is how are you going to homogenize the model? What is the homogenization philosophy for your solution? Because again, the challenge with working with an RV is that your domain are quite limited. How do you, from that microstructure, from that representable element, be able to generate a constitutive behavior that can be representative of the ball? And due to this size dichotomy between a micro scale and a macro scale behavior, you find that it can be a bit challenging to extract constitutive behavior reliably. And so this is where homogenization comes in. So how do you want to homogenize your model so that whatever constitutive behavior, whatever stress strain data you generate from that system, it can be comparable to what's happening at the macro scale. There are people within the community that call this a smearing approach, where you smear the behavior of the system so that you can generate some interesting behavior from the micro scale that compares to the macro scale. So your homogenization philosophy is important. And there are different strategies for doing this. There is a, an asymptotic homogenization, which is quite mathematical. But the, the part that I use quite a lot in Abacus is a computational homogenization. And there are different philosophies within the community. Key really is that you want to be able to find a way to compress, to homogenize, to average out the behavior within the microstructure, and then that becomes representative of what happens at the macrostructure. So in the past, I've done simulations where I'm able to extract the effective properties, the, the yield stress, the fracture behavior from a microscale model at an RV level. So why I'm able to do that is because I implemented computational homogenization in my model. So you need to be able to consider that as well if you are trying to use an RV modeling approach. The final thing that you need to consider is how your RV conclusions actually compare with the experiments. And what I mean by that is your validation philosophy. What is your validation strategy? Every time you do a computational modeling approach, you do need to think about how do I validate my result? How do I prove that my results are reliable? And so this final number six consideration is important. So when you homogenize the system and extract stress strain data, do you have some sort of experimental data, real life data, probably generated at a macro scale model that you can use to compare with what's happening at the 
lower scale at this RVA level. So the strategy for comparing your properties or your stress strain data is another thing you need to consider when you are exploring using this RV modeling approach in your model. And the final thing, which is a bonus point I want to leave with you as we come to the end of this video is the consideration that your RVE size is really critical. A lot of times when people isolate an RVE, they run with it. But you find out that if you use a bigger RV or a smaller RV, your model will begin to change and behave differently. So RV size effect is absolutely important when you are considering choosing the RV modeling approach. So if you're interested in learning the effect of RV, then this is a video that can show you clearly why RV size is an important consideration when exploring RV modeling. Thank you for your interest in this video and I hope to see you in the next and bye-bye.